we live in the era of uh, the post-truth era, it is said. The era of fake news, of alternative facts. Um, and it seems that opinions are decreasingly based on objective facts, but rather on emotions, on belief, and so on. And if we look at the thousands of ways we can spread these uh, messages uh, through the World Wide Web, um, you can get pretty pessimistic, actually. But um, in the coming 15 minutes, I'd like to show you something new, a silent revolution, if you wish. Um, and this is all about using online information to challenge more powerful actors in this world, to challenge, to, to figure out what the facts are. And this is called digital open source investigation. Um, basically, anyone with an internet connection and anyone with a laptop can access so much information, that very same information that is being spread around in this post-truth era, um, to use and to figure out what may be going on. Um, but, well, this is the best I can do with my uh, PowerPoint uh, <laughs> animations. I'd like to start with, uh, with basically, it's not as a game. This is a Facebook friend of mine, asking a, a Dutch journalist, and he's posting pictures on his Facebook profile asking, rara waar ben ik, or guess, where am I? Now, this is a nice game, right? Because he posts a photo, and in this initial case, I recognize the skyline because I used to hitchhike a lot, and I've been to the city several times, and I recognize the skyline of the capital of Poland, Warsaw. So I thought, okay, wait a second, I can actually figure out where he took the photo from. So I went to Google Earth, and you have 3D in Google Earth, and I figured out the exact location where he took the photo from. As you can see, you can see the exact building, which you, for example, see here, we can see it here, and so forth, the skyline. So I commented on his photo, like, well, I think you're in the Logos Hotel in Warsaw. Uh, I guess around the fifth or sixth floor? And he reacted, fourth floor. But there is a kind of floor in between, so I was kind of right. <laughs> so this became a more of a nice game to play. He posted a photo, and sometimes it's really easy. I mean, I think all of you know what it is, right? Exactly, London. I mean, the buses, Oxford Street and London to be exact. And uh, again, I can use Google Street View, for example, to stand at the exact location where he took the photo from. Now, sometimes it can get more tricky, so you start looking for visual clues. Like, for example, there's no landmark here and so on, so you have to look for, for maybe signs somewhere. Okay, this may be in the Netherlands and so forth. And we try finding the exact location again. Now, sometimes there is not even buildings or signs, it's just a landscape. For example, here. Now, you may think, how on earth can you ever find this? But I was originally born in, in Leeuwarden and never would travel to Schiphol, for example. Anyone who has ever traveled with a train from uh, Almere to uh, Lelystad knows what a kind of depressing area it is between those two cities. <laughs> so I was like, this can't only be one area in the Netherlands, right? Um, this must be um, between those cities. And then it's just looking for the river on satellite imagery and the train tracks. And indeed, I could figure out the exact location, even the bend in the river, the tree trees, and even the, the white spots here of sand. Now, this is a game. But this is using online op information, which is openly available to anyone with an internet connection, to figure out an answer to those questions. It's a puzzle. And three years ago, a group was found, a collective called Bellingcat, to bring those people that are doing this together and to work together on more, let's perhaps say, important questions. Not a game with a Facebook friend, but figuring out what's happening in a conflict zone, um, what is happening um, between, uh, well, in, 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 in war. And Bellingcat stems from the English uh, idiom, in the cat, or in Dutch, as we say, the cat and bell aanbinden. And it's from a Greek fable of a group of mice that is very afraid of this large and dangerous cat. And they're wondering, how can we be aware when the cat is coming close to us and we are being, well, we are in, uh, on the threat? And one, ID, uh, one mouse has an idea and he says, we should put a bell around the neck of the cat. Because then each time it comes close, we are warned. Well, good idea, but how could they ever do that? Because the mice, is, the mice are all so small and the cat is so large. Well, they say we should cooperate together because only then we can bell the cat. And that's what we're trying to do at Belling Cat. And I'd like to show you two examples uh, how this collective of mice, basically, because this is all what I'm presenting, is all the teamwork of all of us, um, has done this. So the first case I'll be presenting is uh, something obviously very familiar here in the Netherlands, MH17. And the second case is uh, the bombing of a mosque in Syria. MH17 was departing not far from here, uh, from Schiphol Airport, uh, destined for Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. 
uh, when it disappeared from the radar above eastern Ukraine. And immediately after that happened, there were a lot of theories what may have happened to that plane. Um, some said it was shot down by Ukraine, some said it was shot down by Russia, others said it was shot down by separatists fighting in eastern Ukraine. Some even went that far to say that bombs were planted on board at Schiphol. So people online started to wondering, okay, who can we still trust with the claims? Is it the Dutch government? Is it the Russian government? Is it the US? Well, what can we find out online? Now, this was a really important picture in that investigation because people say, were saying this was a showing, something very interesting over here, a Bok missile launcher, which is an anti-aircraft missile system. And, oh, sorry. And um, we were wondering, can we figure out the exact location where this photo was taken? Because if this was indeed in the territory, it's obviously a very interesting photo. Now here is actually, this photo is asking us, guess where am I? So we start looking for those visual clues. And the visual clue here is the name of a shop. Because we can just type that name of the shop into Google. And we find someone has been so kind to list a wiki page of shops in the towns in eastern Ukraine, this Torres, and this magazine Stroidom. Okay, we have a name which corresponds to what we saw in the image. Then we start Googling further, and we see that uh, there is a court document related to this shop because there was once a fight. Not relevant for an investigation, but this is openly available information, and it lists an address. So we can type the address into Google Earth, and we'll just fly to the exact location. And in that way, we can compare what we see on the ground image with what we see on the satellite, thus confirming the location. Um, what is even more important, so we, we could send locals, for example, local reporters, to the exact same scene to take a picture from what we thought it was taken here. And I don't know, I'm not sure what's going wrong. Um, so basically, we, 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 we tried to compare that location. If you look at this image, somebody took a picture at the exact same site of where the photo was taken. If you make an overlay, as you can see, you can see where the book was standing. So we could confirm the location. But what we also were interested in was determining a rough estimate of time. When was the picture taken? So since a very long time ago, we have those sundials, right? Not a sundial, but like we, we basically we use the shadow to determine, well, to give an impression of time, because the shadow changes when the sun is shining, obviously. So nowadays, there is a tool called Suncalk, and it if allows you, if you know the exact location, to see how shadow changes during the day. So we were able to determine the time of the day as well of when the photo was taken. Now this is a small puzzle piece, but you have to imagine in the 21st century there's so many people with mobile phones, and especially if there's military equipment driving by, people are taking photos of it, people are taking videos of it, and they're uploading it to social media, to YouTube, to Facebook, to Vierkontakte. So this is an example of one of such puzzle pieces, but there was way more. Like for example this video where we can see a similar convoy, perhaps even the same, driving. And in this way, we're able to map where this Bok anti-aircraft missile system was traveling through separatist-held eastern Ukraine before MH17 was shot down. So we had a clear indication, okay, the, this may have been something to do with it, because this was one of the theories why MH, or, uh, by what MH17 was shot down. But at the same time, there is this information war going on. And this is a satellite image presented by uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense four days after MH17 was shot down. And I would like to call this like a kind of Colin Powell moment of Russia. Remember, before the Iraq war, they presented satellite imagery at the UN. You look, Saddam has uh, weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, what are you going to do if you see this satellite image? It's just like, yeah, must be true, because how can we check what's on the satellite image? Well, nowadays, everybody can check it. And that's what we try to do here as well. Because what did the Russian Ministry of Defense say? This is 14th of July 2014, three days before MH17 was shot down. And they say, look, this is a Ukrainian military base, and there's a Bok missile launcher standing there. Now we have a satellite imagery of the 17th of July, the day that MH17 was shot down. It's not there. Well, obviously, that's very interesting information. We don't care what the outcome is. We just want to fact check stuff. Maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe this, this is the one we've been tracking, right? But then we start, okay, can we date those images? So we start looking on open source satellite imagery, for example, available through Google Earth, and we compare them with the dates. And what we see here in the top corner is this stretch of trees, right? This is 14th of July. If we go to open source imagery of the 17th of July, we can see there are no trees there. Okay, it could be that in three days they, they cut down all the trees. Could be. 
But if we start listing all the open source satellite imagery of that location, we can see that on the 2nd, 17th, and 21st, there were no trees standing at that location. So how on earth is it possible that on the Russian Ministry of Defense imagery on the 14th of July, there's suddenly trees standing there? And this was one indication that they presented during this press conference, four days after the aircraft was shot down, misdated satellite imagery. This, this has nothing to do with those dates. This, this was from way before those images. So this only created more interest in investigating, okay, can we track where this bug then came from? Because obviously it didn't come from this base. But there was one problem. Look at this video. Look how many similar vehicles are on deep loaders here, on the back of trucks. How could we be sure that we're tracing the right vehicle in the area? So my colleague at Bellingcat came up with an idea with the side skirts fingerprint. It's basically comparing above the, the, the wheels, there is this side skirt, and it damages along the way it's being driven, along the way it's being used. So we build a database of all the Bok anti-aircraft missiles that were being spotted on social media images um, in the area, just to be sure we're tracing the right vehicle. And in that way, we were able to trace a vehicle also across the border going back in time. So these are digital footsteps of an anti-aircraft missile, June 25, June 24. And it ended at June 23 around a city called Kursk. So we thought, OK, may maybe there is an anti-aircraft brigade stationed there. And there was. You tap it into Google, and there is. And surprise, surprise, they're active on social media. They have a social media page. And they were so kind to post a list of attendances of people that are in certain units. So we just type those names into social media, and you find their social media profiles. Now, this is not an interesting photo, but they also post pictures of the military convoys giving more open source information. And sometimes we didn't even have to geolocate it because they would post in front of the pictures where they're traveling through. <laughs> now, this is so much open source information that we could make a solid case that MH17 was shot down by this Buck missile launcher, which was supplied by Russia to separatists. This is not to say it's not a smoking gun. We don't know what happened inside the vehicle. We don't know who traveled inside. But we have been able to identify the people that were responsible for this unit and even for this specific vehicle. Now, obviously, all those names are uh, here anonymized, but this information we, have been, we, we gave to the joint investigative team, which is led by the Dutch uh, authorities, uh, by the Dutch police, and um, obviously, well, everybody who's been following this has seen that this is indeed has been um, confirmed, the, the things we found by the joint investigative team. So this really shows the strength of what you can do from behind your laptop, just to figuring out what the facts are. But I want to show you another example. And that's an example how sometimes an investigation just starts. We have a social media post here. And it says uh, there has been an airstrike happening on a mosque in Syria. OK, sure, we have this claim. There were more people talking about it. OK, it was Russia that bombed the mosque. And then you see those headlines showing up in international media. At least 42 dead in Russian raids on Aleppo mosque. Well, it would be easy to investigate Russia again, right? We just saw before how sometimes they're a little bit lousy with their social media. But what we always do, and that's what I say, and I want to stress again, we don't care what the outcome is. We just want to investigate. Can we confirm an airstrike took place? Can we confirm it was done by Russia? And can we confirm it was a mosque? Well, starting at looking at social media images posted from that site, we also saw this image. And this doesn't look like a weapon remnant of a Russian missile, because this is in Latin script, and most Russian weapons have Cyrillic script. And actually, if we compare it to one of the most famous uh, uh, missiles of the US, the Hellfire missile, we can see that the label looks very similar. So this started a very long investigation. And actually, the US admitted they struck the mosque. Um, they admitted they struck the mosque. Uh, oh, sorry. They, they admitted they struck this location, but they denied it was a mosque. So we could geolocate it again and so forth. This is open source imagery. But the US was denying that they struck a mosque. They said we explicitly they, we didn't strike this, strike this mosque. Again, we don't care whether it was a mosque or not. We do want to investigate. Was the mosque or was it just a random meeting hall, as they said in this statement released by CENTCOM from the Pentagon? So we communicated with Human Rights Watch and Forensic Architecture. And we all started the investigations and shared our findings. And we, all the three of us, based on open source imagery and based on Human Rights Watch uh, testimonies, we could only reach one conclusion, and was that this building that was targeted, which we see here, was simply a very large mosque under construction. 
So what we did is basically get all this information together, all this open source material from the site, and try to figure out, okay, how did this incident evolve in space and time? And by that means, Forensic Architecture built a 3D model of the model, putting all those puzzle pieces on there, just to get a better impression what was this building being used for. So we can see here, for example, a very large bomb crater. And um, we can see how this event evolved in space and time. So these were two large bomb craters consistent with 500 pound bombs each. So this is, they evaporated the whole north part of the building. But we also found footage from before the strike. And this is very important because people were saying, oh, they just said it was a mosque after the airstrike. But in this image, you can actually see on top of the building, the Avan speaker, for example, used for the call to prayer. What we can also see is a sign of the mosque entrance showing it was in the site Ibn Ibn al-Khattab Mosque. We also have footage from inside showing more um, images that it basically everything points toward it being a mosque. So we challenged the Pentagon, and again they said, no, okay, fair enough, you did an investigation, but it's not a mosque. You just don't have the intelligence, the intel we have. Well, it's fair enough, it's right, but based on these kind of images, we, we had to stick to a conclusion. It's simply, there's even a mihrab, which shows the direction to Mecca, where you have to pray. Well, the Pentagon did start an internal investigation, and after a few weeks, they had to admit that they were wrong, and they indeed struck a large mosque complex. So this, to me, really showed the power of these kind of investigations. You're able to challenge one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, Ministry of Defense. This is just one example of an airstrike of thousands. We're almost looking at this on a daily basis. It's Syria and Iraq, and the larger the circle, the more airstrikes, and the more we think civilian casualties, and it's just too much to investigate. Well, having that said, I hope I have sh could have shown you a little bit of how the group of mice works together uh, from around borders, from around uh, the world, uh, from different uh, professions, uh, but only using the laptop and an internet connection. Thank you.